Good morning to you all. A warm spring welcome to Burkitt's Strategic Land and Agricultural Seminar. Our focus today is water and in particular sustainable water and wastewater management. An especially warm welcome to our speaker, John Gillett, Managing Director of Gurney Environmental. Thank you also to Chris Coupland, Head of Burkitt's Agriculture and Estates team uh, for joining us uh, for questions. The format for today uh, is in a moment, John will take us through some of Gurney environmental projects, the briefs, challenges and solutions uh, they've come up with. Chris will wind up and then there'll be a chance for you to uh, ask questions and us to answer them. We anticipate the seminar will last 45 minutes to an hour. If there are any technical uh, problems, please stay with us um, or rejoin. We'll try and resume connections as soon as possible. And hopefully none of us will appear as a cat. You'll see you've got a message box. Um, please use it to comment and raise questions as we go. We will try and answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm sure any of us will be happy to answer any follow up uh, queries by email. Sustainability has ridden very much to the top of the agenda for many businesses uh, in the last few years. The target for carbon neutral is 2050. That's only 38 years away. And many businesses have made it an ambition to actually beat that by many years. Landowners have increasingly diverse businesses and increasingly looking at their businesses with sustainability and carbon neutrality and environmental impact as a number one priority. Developers also, as businesses, and on a project by project basis, are measuring their environmental impact. Positive biodiversity impact for most development is now a legal requirement. I believe there's a real opportunity for landowners and developers to work very closely together to help deliver on their environmental and um, sustainability ambitions. Sustainable water use is very much one such area. I'm going to hand over to John in a moment, but first, Gurney Environmental have a Im very impressive range of national and international clients. And as we'll no doubt hear from John, they've been providing bespoke wastewater solution to some notable landowners. For what is now almost two decades, Gurney Environmental have been delivering water solutions um, to many businesses and developers in advance of the cycle. It's a great pleasure to have John with us. And John, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Burkitts, for the opportunity to uh, to present what uh, we do, present my company, present myself, and uh, and some of the projects that we've been involved with uh, both re both recently and uh, over the past uh, number of decades. Uh, Gurney Environmental is a is a company that was established in 2007. Um, although my uh, my background in this technology goes back to something like 1989. I, I ha ha hesitate to think. Uh, when I was fortunate enough, fortunate enough to um, have a meeting with a gentleman who was based in North Dakota uh, in the United States, a, a rural state in the United States. And uh, in the discussion that I had with him, uh, and this was in Louisiana, uh, he introduced me to the technology uh, of lagoon-based solutions for wastewater treatment. Uh, being from the UK, I suggested that maybe activated sludge, uh, 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 MBR systems, uh, rotating biological contactors, and all the various mechanical solutions were, were far more of what we should be doing, rather than just creating large lakes of wastewater. Um, and uh, and and he very carefully and uh, concisely pointed out to me that yes, that is potentially what we should be doing. But he says, do bear in mind that with a lagoon-based process. We have very little energy cost, if in fact any. We don't produce any sludge, so we don't have to handle sludge. We don't have to tanker it away. We don't have to treat it. 
We don't have to pasteurize it. We don't have to put it into the ground. We don't have to do anything with it, or at the time, dispose of it at the sea, which was what ha was happening prior to 1989. He says, our investment, and in North Dakota, we have lots of land. Our investment is in land. We invest in land because we have it. It's not expensive. And in return, what we get is a sustainable, environmentally friendly, very inexpensive method of wastewater treatment. And for our communities, which are typically 100 miles apart, while they're called cities, there may be 10,000 people, 5,000 people, we very much rely on the cost of operating our wastewater treatment uh, through the rates and the taxes that we raise from the people who live in the cities. So while we may be able to get grants from the government, from the EPA, from the government, whoever it is, to actually build a mechanical wastewater treatment plant, we don't actually get any grant for the cost of operation, for the energy, the chemicals, the manpower, the sludge handling and disposal and all the other costs which are associated with uh, operating a wastewater treatment plant. He says, so for us, it's, it's a much better investment uh, to cut out a, a section of land uh, to create with earthen banks, which we form from the earth that's on the ground, uh, to create these uh, lagoon systems, these lakes, these ponds, uh, and allow effectively Mother Nature uh, then to provide the treatment with the discharge quality being equivalent to what would be provided by a, a mechanical treatment works, but obviously at a much lower cost. So the challenge that uh, we have today is, is very much a, a similar one to the communities in, uh, in North Dakota and elsewhere in the United States, uh, a lower capital cost for construction. Where do we invest our money? Is it in land? Is it in earthen ponds, lined? Or do we invest that money into mechanical systems, to concrete, to lots of pumps, lots of aeration, lots of compressors, uh, with the obviously added on cost of the OPEX, uh, the people to run it, the cost of energy, the chemicals, the sludge handling disposal, and all the other ancillary costs that, uh, that go with that. So our challenge today, and what we've always uh, endeavored to try and uh, explain to our, our customers is that CAPEX, OPEX, and TOTEX over the life of the treatment plant is what is the critical, critical uh, calculation that we need to look at uh, currently. And we are gradually, uh, and I say we have gradually, we have certainly haven't won the battle by any means, but over the last, and it's actually now three decades which I, since I've been doing this work, and, and actually it's uh, three decades where I've been fortunate enough to work in most uh, continents of the world, uh, down in South America, United States, uh, North America, uh, Europe, uh, Middle East, and Australia and New Zealand as well. So it's been, I've been very fortunate to see what has been done elsewhere around the world and the problems, the benefits, what's good, what's bad, and so on. Uh, and I think that allows us as Gurney Environmental to, to be able to look at a particular problem, uh, a wastewater problem, and and provide a solution uh, uh, based on a, a good deal of experience uh, from around the world. In the three decades that uh, that we've been working on this, it's really since 1994 when uh, Stantec, who were a consulting engineering firm or are a consulting engineering firm, first started to contact us to inquire about the use of the technology that uh, we were looking at at the time, but shown on the, the bottom right hand corner of the, of the screen here for use in a lagoon-based application out in, uh, out in uh, the Omar. And uh, once we started working with them, uh, they started to feed our information throughout uh, their uh, business. And we started to look with them at some projects up in Scotland. Uh, the first one which we carried out was uh, at a place called Errol, which is just outside uh, just outside Dundee. And that was first completed and commissioned in the year 2000. So in 2021, we're now 20 years uh, on since that first wastewater treatment plant for that community of 2000 people was built. Prior to that, it had been very difficult to encourage the UK to look away from mechanical systems and look at lagoon-based solutions. But today, after 20 years, Scottish Water have had the benefit of utilizing a, uh, a lagoon-based wastewater treatment system. We call it Aerofac. Uh, to provide the wastewater treatment for this community. 
they've not had any slug handling. Uh, they've had very little uh, main, uh, replacement parts requirements. They've had some energy, but that's all. And uh, it's met its consents on every day of the year for the last 20, 21 years. Uh, and as a result, uh, we are and have built other treatment plants for them uh, and are continuing to do so uh, at this start time as we are providing uh, additional designs as well. So where we have got to today is we've got to a, a situation where in 2021, uh, Gurney Environmental, uh, just jumped ahead slightly, Gurney Environmental are, are currently constructing a, a, a new wastewater treatment plant uh, for Yorkshire Water. And uh, this is going to be the largest wastewater treatment system, uh, the Aerofac wastewater treatment system that we have built uh, in the United Kingdom. And it will be the first new wastewater treatment plant uh, the Yorkshire Water have built in 20 years. Uh, initially, having had a, an activated sludge plant uh, installed and specified, sorry, specified, not installed, specified, uh, they decided that actually, in the end, looking for something that had a lower capex and a lower opex and more sustainable uh, was certainly going to be a more uh, long-term suitable solution uh, than uh, perhaps uh, the activated sludge plant that they were looking at at the time. Interestingly, uh, Scottish Water uh, have recently written to us after 20 years of operating the Errol Wastewater Treatment Plant and quite candidly have said, well, 20 years ago, sustainability, low carbon footprint uh, wasn't necessarily the driver of the business at the time uh, when Errol, the plant at Errol was built. Uh, sustainability and low carbon footprint are very much the drivers of their business now and Errol is certainly providing a very good example of how that can be achieved uh, using the technology uh, that we have to offer. This is a this picture here finally is a site at uh, Warren Mill. Um, it's near Bamburgh Castle, it's on the coast, you can see the coastline in the background. Um, we were asked four years ago, five years ago, I think by Northumbrian Water to look at their first solution. The key drivers for them uh, were the change in population. Uh, during the winter, the small community of Warren Mill drops down to about 200 people. It may even be less than that. Uh, however, because this is a very popular tourist area, uh, the summer population as a result of two caravan sites increases in a, to a peak of up to about 3,000 people during the summer months. It's very difficult for a short retention, uh, which is maybe only 24 hours, mechanical wastewater treatment plant to be able to adjust without operator intervention, without some form of seeding, without a good experienced uh, operator to run them, to adjust from that 200 people to that 3,000 people. Nobody really knows when that's going to happen either. Um, last year in May, when we had really a, a very nice sunny May, uh, lots of people would arrive in their caravans. Whereas if May and June are not very nice, uh, people don't turn up until July. Uh, so it makes it very difficult for traditional mechanical wastewater treatment systems to be able to accommodate these changes in population. And this is where Aerofac, with the investment in land, and the retention time that we provide within each cell allows us to accommodate these changes in population and flow without any operator retention, uh, without any seeding, without any chemical addition, and without any of the other OPEX costs that add on to the uh, cost of operation of a wastewater treatment plant. This site, uh, as you're seeing here in the picture, is a primary cell in the foreground. And in the secondary, in the background, we have a secondary cell with obviously the sea and the bay, Butyl Bay in the background. In our primary cell, we allow the wastewater, the raw wastewater to come in and we allow the solids to settle to the bottom of the cell. In this blanket of sludge that we form on the bottom, we establish, or naturally the bugs establish as anaerobic bugs and we get a nice digestive process where methane fumin, methane fermentation and acid putrefaction and all the other good rotting processes that mother nature provides us takes the organic matter that's dropped in there and breaks it down breaks it down into hydrogen sulfide gases a bit of ash a bit of methane a bit of carbon dioxide just sort of general rotting processes 
uh, that take place naturally in nature, whether it's in the bottom of a lagoon such as ours, or whether it's in a lake, or whether it's in your compost heap, or, or wherever. What we do as a, as a company and a design, uh, we make sure that above this, about 30 centimeters of sludge, we allow three and a half to four meters of aerobic water uh, to be able to sit on top of that. So any odors caused by hydrogen sulfide are immediately filtered out. So there are no odors from our wastewater treatment plants at all. And in the aerobic zone above, in that three meter, four meter water column, we allow the reduction in biological oxygen demand, which is one of the components which the EA tests for when the water is discharged or the effluent is discharged into a receiving stream. We allow that to be addressed by the aeration system, uh, which you can see in the foreground in the sort of H type arrangement, and our equipment on the right there, which is called a Series 3, which is powered by wind uh, with a small backup motor on the top there. Um, the principal method of operation of this is that as the wastewater comes in, we allow a 20 day, 25 day retention in the primary. Our series three operates all the time, either powered by wind or, or backed up by an electric motor. And then the diffused air system is controlled by a dissolved oxygen probe. And if the dissolved oxygen drops down uh, as the load increases, then the diffused air system will operate to make sure that dissolved oxygen level is maintained at the level that we want it to, to maintain aerobic conditions throughout the water column. But the default setting of our diffuser is off. Uh, it only comes on when it's required, when the demand is such that the Series 3 or number of Series 3s uh, cannot maintain the oxygen within the cell itself. So our cost of operation uh, of our primary stage can in many cases be zero. So for instance, in this application, uh, during the winter period where the wind is blowing strong and where the population may be only 200, the load will be light, the, DO, the dissolved oxygen levels will be high, the Series 3 will be operating in the wonderful winds that we get, and as a result, there's no electricity charge uh, that Northumbrian Water is having to pay uh, to maintain uh, the system in operation. So that's significant saving to them. Whereas mechanical plants, whether they're clargesters or whether they're RBCs or membrane bioreactors or activated sludge, generally have a requirement to operate the system pretty much continually to maintain uh, mixed liquid suspended solids, solids in suspension, whatever it is. Uh, the more intense the process, uh, the more energy is required. So this is where we were able to explain to Northumbrian Water that an investment in land uh, to create and form uh, the lagoons would actually have significant savings in operating costs, whether it's energy, whether it's operator time, sludge handling disposal, uh, and also with uh, sustainability as well. Because what we have found is that, and been able to demonstrate to them, as well as other water companies, is that where you form banks out of earth and then put in a geomembrane liner and use very little uh, concrete uh, to uh, for within the system at all, your actual inbuilt carbon is significantly less too. So your carbon footprint uh, is considerably smaller uh, than uh, it would be for a mechanical system, even though the physical footprint obviously has some, uh, is, is and will be larger. And then if you then extrapolate that out and include the operating costs and the lower operating costs, the ongoing uh, carbon footprint and carbon footprint over the life of the facility is going to be far less uh, than uh, would be a mechanical system of equivalent size, meeting treating wastewater for the equivalent number of people and to provide the same level of discharge quality that is being discharged into whether it's a receiving stream, a, a, a lake or whatever. Um, so the primary stage is that uh, is a combination of aerobic, anaerobic treatment, and the secondary stage is, is all aerobic uh, treatment, where we make sure that the biological oxygen demand, uh, the suspended solids, uh, those two items that are monitored by the EA, and uh, ammonia, uh, which is obviously, again, a, uh, something that the EA will monitor for certain receiving streams, small streams, sites of special scientific interest, for instance, are all make sure that they're brought down to a level uh, that will uh, meet the requirements uh, of the uh, of the EA and the receiving stream that's there. So this is just a, a system which was completed last year 
um, five years in uh, <laughs> in design development, uh, but is there to meet the particular requirements uh, of this particular application, which is this huge change in population uh, from winter to summer. This is another example that uh, uh, was uh, built by the Crown Estate uh, in 2010. The particular requirement uh, here was um, in the middle of Windsor Great Park, uh, there they have a, 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 a residential conference centre uh, called Cumberland Lodge, uh, which will take up to about 500 people uh, over a weekend or over a week. It just depends on what the conference is. Uh, they had an existing mechanical treatment works there. And again, similar to the previous one at Warren Mill, they were struggling to be able to keep the system operating when there was no flow and then people would arrive for the weekend and there was lots of flow. And as a result, it was not able to uh, it was able to accommodate the, uh, the requirements. We were asked by the Crown Estate, uh, having done work at Sandringham in Norfolk uh, five years before, uh, to come down and have a look at what they had and provide a, a solution uh, to uh, similar to what we had done at uh, Sandringham. So again, a little Aerofact plant was proposed, uh, again, able to operate with no flow, able to accommodate the peak flows that would happen at a weekend or during a week uh, when Cumberland Lodge was full. And this was discharging into a, a lake, uh, a site of special scientific interest, right in the middle of Windsor Great Park, and as you can see from the top picture, again, using just earthen construction, uh, so very little tanker movements, sorry, very little uh, construction movement. We just brought a digger in, uh, dug some holes, lined it, uh, filled it with water, and then set the system operating. We've been able to eliminate here, just as we've been able to eliminate at Warren Mill, any sludge being taken out of the site. So there are no tankers now going through Windsor Great Park, whereas there were previously taking sludge from the wastewater treatment plant and taking that out to wherever the discharge point was or where, wherever they go to dispose of it. And that is one of the key things that planners today, we find, uh, are interested in. If you're going to put a new wastewater treatment plant in, where is it going to be located? What are the traffic movements, uh, particularly tanker movements? And one of the real advantages of our system is that we don't need to be located near an A road, which is typically what's required in order to be able to get tankers out. We can place this system, uh, just as this one is, uh, just down a small track in the middle of Windsor Great Park. Uh, it's not even a tarmac road, uh, it's just an earth track to this site. Just enough to get a van in uh, for the operator to come down uh, and do the maintenance that's required, which is typically once a year, uh, and that's really, uh, that's really all that's required. Uh, this system has been operating since 2010, uh, and again, uh, very little has been required in OPEX, just some energy to run the blower, uh, which is on the left there, the diffused air and blower system. Just an annual replacement of a grease service pack on each of the Series 3s, uh, and, and that's really been about it uh, as far as uh, this class has been concerned. Looking at another site, which is in uh, Norfolk. This is uh, on the Holcomb Estate. Uh, which is in North Norfolk. This this is slightly different and again demonstrates uh, a, a, an investment in land uh, that again landowners certainly have the opportunity to do. Uh, developers uh, are uh, certainly look at it slightly differently uh, but this particular estate uh, they felt that uh, for the 500 population plant that they wanted to build Having looked at uh, package plants, reed beds, little activated sludge plants, all of these which would have been uh, built next to the main road, the A A149 uh, up here, uh, we proposed them a solution which, while significantly larger in footprint, uh, that primary cell there is, is about 4,000 square meters, and the secondary cell in the background is 2,000 square meters. It, for them, because they had the land, uh, the construction cost uh, was just moving earth from around and a liner. Um, it provided them with a much better long-term sustainable solution than looking at mechanical plants that were going to be either uh, either going to require lots of servicing or sludge removal uh, and an operator uh, and so on. This site, uh, this the, the reason why they 
this site is different in that this is an Accelifax system rather than an Aerofax system, in that there's no aerated faculty, there's no aero, aero, aerated system here. It's just using our Series 3s, which you can see that are on the on the top of the two cells. When I took the CEO of Anglian Water here uh, about 15 years ago, uh, and I told him that the total cost of operation uh, of this particular wastewater treatment plant for 500 people was about 70p uh, a day. Uh, he was very surprised, uh, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be uh, building uh, a number of wastewater treatment systems for uh, Anglian Water as a result of that. So I think for Holcomb, the advantage to them is they don't need an operator, and neither of uh, neither does the Crown Estate. They don't have an operator there at all. Um, as long as somebody visits the site once a month to check that the gate is closed. That's uh, quite sufficient uh, for it. When the design was put in uh, back in 2004, 3, 4, it was praised by North Norfolk planners uh, as being a very appropriate way of treating wastewater for small communities. And uh, the low capex was obviously very uh, of great interest to uh, the Holcomb estate, but I think particularly for them, it was the very low operating cost. And the ability to make sure that everything that they treated, is treated on site, uh, nothing goes off site, no sludge is taken off site, no sludge is then injected to in anybody else's ground, uh, it is all done on site, wastewater comes in, treated effluent goes out, and the gate remains closed uh, majority of the time. The, the site is, uh, is, a, is a very interesting one, it's perched up just on the hill, uh, just uh, next to the village, it's very close to the village, uh, within about 200 meters. Uh, as we don't have any odor, uh, we don't have any issues, and uh, it's, it receives strong winds uh, throughout the year, uh, good winds throughout the year. Um, and even during the be recent Beast of the East that we had, which was anywhere near the Beast of the East we had a number of years ago, uh, a lagoon-based process is still operational, the Series 3s are still continually moving the water from the bottom to the top to maintain the cells open uh, and unfrozen uh, so the processing continue, can continue at all times. Certainly in recent years, and certainly since the last piece of the yeast, um, the reed bed systems, some manufacturers or some installers, some designers have felt that maybe there is a vulnerability in reed beds in that if it does get very cold uh, during the winter, they can freeze. And as a result, you know, potentially uh, wastewater treatment may not continue. Um, and as a result, they, they may not be able to provide reliable, consistent treatment, uh, even under uh, severe conditions. One of the nice things about the technology transfer that we have taken uh, from North Dakota uh, is that it's considerably colder over there, uh, potentially with ice thicknesses up to two to three feet during the winter minus 40 degrees uh, as, a, as a wind chill. Uh, so coming here, it's a, it's a very safe technology transfer. So those are three, three different examples, one from a water company, uh, just with uh, large changes in flow and load due, as a result of population uh, and tourism. Uh, the second one obviously is just a, a, a conference center, but being making sure that we were uh, meeting the requirements of a, a sensitive area. Uh, and again, this is a, another example of how uh, we can deal with it in, a, in another way uh, to make sure that, um, uh, that we're meeting the requirements of, uh, of the Environment Agency, but doing it in the least cost possible. If land is available, then Accelifac is a very, very cost-effective solution. Uh, if land is not so available, then we add in aeration and we can make the footprint smaller. And as a result, we can fit into uh, smaller spaces. Uh, it very much depends on, on the application. Each application is different, uh, each consent is different, uh, each site is different. And so as a company, we tend to, we make sure that we're uh, looking at the merits of each system, uh, depending on what's required for, for each different application. So just as a summary of, of the Aerofax system, uh, and just really just to, to clarify, uh, the blowers, that we use in our system only come on as required. They're controlled by a dissolved oxygen probe, and they only come on when the load uh, is such that it does require aeration to be applied. This means that the 
diffuse their system, the blower is off. So we're not using any energy. We're only using energy when we need to use energy and we keep the cost of operation down to a minimum. The system reacts to the flow and loading at any given hour, day, week or year of operation. Uh, so for instance, in the winter, it may not run at all for the example of Warren Mill and in the summer, it can perhaps be running uh, all of the time. Uh, but at least we're maintaining uh, the lowest cost of operation. If there's very little loading, there's no operating cost. And even in when we're looking at development, and we've looked at a number of developments over the years, one of the uh, advantages is that we can build our Aerofax system for the full design population, and it will still operate even if there's only 10 houses, or 20 houses, or 50 houses, or 100 houses, whatever it, whatever it is. Um, and then we can make sure that when those additional houses or sections are actually built on, the wastewater treatment plant is there and available to operate uh, and accommodate that load. Um, and as a result, uh, we can keep the operating costs down in the early years uh, of construction. And as populations, uh, as houses are built and populations arrive, then obviously the cost of operation will go up, but there are more people obviously to send a, a bill to. Uh, and as a result, that, uh, uh, that, that, that is satisfying the demand, the oxygen demand or the energy demand or the the cost of operation uh, that's being applied. We can handle huge swings in flows and loading, uh, so storm events are not a problem, the recent rains we've had not a problem at all. Uh, all three of the solutions that I've shown you all take way above what is typically capable of achieving by mechanical systems uh, and as a result we're ideal for either tourism, uh, industry or, or large potential growth areas, be that development uh, or, or whatever. Um, so when we are looking at the benefits and the opportunities um, uh, that the system that we have to offer provides, uh, we first of all have an enhanced biological optimization provided by the mechanical equipment uh, that we provide. It's ensuring consistent, uh, reliable processing, uh, whereas old stabilization ponds might have perhaps been a little variable. Uh, by adding in a certain amount of mechanical kit, uh, we can actually make the system more reliable, uh, certainly maintain uh, self-digesting sludge within the system um, and making sure that we're not having to uh, provide sludge handling and disposal, we're keeping tankers off the road, we're not worried about regulation, we're not even concerned about uh, potential costs uh, if sludge, uh, sludge disposal uh, conditions uh, and legislation changes in the future. Uh, so that takes away a lot of concern for, for many of the customers that we work with. Um, the construction method is a balanced cut and fill. Uh, we're using the earth that's on site. Uh, we're forming that into banks. We're not taking any earth off site. We're not bringing any earth in. Uh, and as a result, we're using very little concrete. Uh, and as a result, we're minimizing our, our carbon footprint as well. With the equipment we put in and maintaining aerobic conditions, from the surface of the cell right down to the bottom, uh, we're maintaining strong error, strong odor control. Uh, so there are no odor, there is no odor from these facilities. And while this has been somewhat of a, a discussion point all the way along uh, with uh, new and uh, with new customers, uh, we've got plenty of data uh, from water companies who have actually been to a number of our sites with uh, odor sniffers looking out for hydrogen sulfide and they'll set them all away up around the cell and they'll run the sniffers for a, a number of days or a number of weeks to do a survey and and in many cases they're contacting the manufacturer of the odor sniffer to find out whether uh, whether they're actually uh, the equipment is working or not because they're not picking up any traces at all uh, of any hydrogen sulfide or anything that might cause a, an odor an offensive odor. We're using uh, wind power, effectively a nice, uh, free, sustainable. This cuts our operating costs uh, back to the bare bones. Uh, we don't need any chemicals at all. Every, all the biology, all the components that we need to treat the wastewater uh, is actually within the sewage as it comes into the system. Um, it's, it's, it's what's going on in nature. It's, uh, it's just we're controlling it in a, in a rectangular shaped cell uh, with mechanical equipment a minimum amount of mechanical equipment on top, uh, just to make sure, uh, just to give it a bit of a push and a help uh, as part of the design. We require very little in the way of operation and maintenance. As I said, we're just using a, uh, just using a once a, a year visit for a, a grease pack replacement uh, on the Series 3s. 
um, and uh, the blower needs them once a year grease as well. Uh, our diffused air si si system is all stainless steel, so there are no membranes, there's no plastic, there's no, no rubber membranes or anything like that uh, that need replacing or anything like that. So it's it's a system which is robust, it's built to last, it's built to learn, last the life of the facility uh, and beyond. And one of the advantages that we're also getting from a, a lagoon-based process, which has been recognized by the EPA and obviously WHO as well, uh, is the ability for these systems to naturally disinfect, uh, not only through the retention time that's provided, uh, but the allowance for settlement of helminth, helminth eggs and nematode eggs, uh, but also through the uh, UV penetration of the water uh, and the sun from the sunlight, which provides natural UV disinfection. One of the advantages of the Series 3s and their continual movement of water from the bottom of the cell to the top is that we're continuously exposing uh, water, the full contents of the water column to the surface, and as a result, we're seeing nice uh, disinfection of the full contents of the, of the ponds and, uh, and that allows us to get down to some very, very low levels of, uh, of uh, fecal, uh, fecal coliform uh, being discharged from the treatment works. In many cases, uh, our, our the, the effluent from a lagoon-based process is, is used for irrigation. Uh, it's safe enough to do that. It's, it's something that we would look to uh, discharge into irrigation reservoirs. Um, it's certainly something that is safe to do so. The, uh, the ability to utilize maybe the nitrogen and the phosphorus uh, that is uh, inherent in, in treated effluent as a, as a, uh, uh, as a fertilizer, uh, which is delivered through a, an irrigation system uh, rather than a spread around the fields by a tractor and a spreader perhaps, uh, has some real strong benefits for the future, uh, particularly in, in our part of the country where we have, you wouldn't believe it recently, but we have very low rainfall. Uh, and the number of irrigation reservoirs that have been built over the past decade certainly you know, presents an opportunity where I think the circle uh, of utilizing uh, water uh, to provide drinking water to people, which is then goes to a wastewater treatment plant, which then goes through to a res reservoir, which is then used for a multitude of uh, reuse opportunities. Uh, one of the sites we work with in New Zealand actually use their treated effluent to grow grass in strips, uh, which they then uh, make into haylage, uh, silage, baleage, and uh, this is then fed to cattle, and the cattle obviously are then providing a high protein source. Uh, so rather than discharge their treated effluent into a river, they use it to uh, make beef, uh, which is a, a, a very a very unique and a very uh, sensible uh, thing to do. But we can also use it in hydroponic systems, in greenhouses, for instance, um, and uh, uh, growing vegetables. Uh, in Israel, where we've done some work uh, with further treatment, um, they're even growing tomatoes, lettuces, uh, and uh, all sorts of uh, different crops using treated effluent. There is further treatment, of course, uh, and the method of irrigation is different. They very much use uh, drip irrigation uh, rather than spray, ir spray irrigation. Uh, so it does need a bit of a, a sort of mindset change, but there are many, many ways that we could be using uh, this uh, treated effluent, this valuable resource, uh, rather than just tipping it into a river uh, and then it going out to sea. And I think if we can start to look at how we uh, but take the pressure off the aquifers that are being used not only for providing drinking water, but also providing irrigation water for reservoirs for farming. If we can tie those two together, I think we take a lot of pressure off our aquifers, uh, which would then uh, make sure that uh, uh, we can extend the life of them, but certainly reduce the demand on them. And, uh, and that is something that as a company, going environmental, uh, is always looking to be able to see whether we can uh, uh, to get involved with or do or persuade our customers to do uh, at some point in the future. Um, we'd like to think that the most recent project in um, Yorkshire Water, the one at, uh, just outside Withensea, uh, the area around there is a very dry area, uh, again similar to East Anglia where, where we're based. Uh, we'd like to think that uh, maybe at some point in the future that treated effluent rather than being discharged to the sea uh, could be starting to be used in ir uh, irrigation uh, there. Uh, but it does seem that the water companies have only one uh, one 
uh, frame of reference and that is to provide treated effluent discharge to a watercourse. They don't seem to be able to move on to that next phase of how can we reuse this water for uh, a more beneficial resource. And in many situations where the water companies are suggesting that perhaps the cost of further treatment, removing nitrogen, removing phosphorus, uh, are significant and as a result are saying that the investments are going to be so significant that water bills are going to go through the roof. It, it would seem to me that a far better solution would be to not remove those that nitrogen and phosphorus from the treated effluent so that it's safe to go in or so that it complies with the environment agency's requirements for discharge into receiving streams but we actually put that water into reservoirs build more reservoirs and then and then use that valuable nitrogen and phosphorus uh, that could be uh, for growing crops uh, to feed ourselves in the future so thank you very much i see that i've uh, i've uh, been on for a, a little while that that really is the bit that i would like to leave on and um, if i may i'll i'll now pass back to uh, Chris Copeland and uh, and look forward to answering any any questions that uh, that you may have. Thank you very much for your time. John, thank you very much indeed for a most interesting presentation and thank you to you all for submitting so many questions uh, to us. Uh, please continue to send through any questions you may have uh, through the chat function and We'll look to go through uh, as many uh, questions with John as we can in the time available. Um, but just uh, to begin, uh, we've had a question, John, following on from the reuse of water from the lagoons to um, for irrigation purposes. Could you could you tell us how how what quality of water? is available there as regards the NVZ regulations that farmers and landowners have to comply with for, for spreading water on their land? Um, yeah, the, uh, it, the, the, the development into effluent reuse, you know, still has some way to go. Um, we, uh, we want to try and see how we can use the Israeli model uh, where they use batch systems of irrigation reservoirs, and uh, so the treated effluent, rather than going straight to uh, uh, straight onto land, uh, is actually going into into irrigation reservoirs and being stored, uh, and then that is used as as and when it's required. Uh, because we can't we can't irrigate all year round because things aren't growing all year round. Of course, um, the example I mentioned, which is in New Zealand, um, what they do is they have controlled grass strips. Uh, which are lined, uh, which are attached to the lagoon process that they operate. Uh, and as a result, what they do is they actually uh, just flood these grass strips and allow the grass to take up the nitrogen and the phosphorus. Uh, and they keep moving back and forward uh, from grass strip to grass strip. And as the grass grows, and it, when it gets to a certain level, then they go in and then they actually all cut it down. So actually irrigating treated effluent into nitrogen vulnerable zones is not really something that we you know we're advocating uh it's it's making sure that where we're proposing where where it's required whether the nutrient is provided required that it's done in a controlled manner uh and uh, and not just sort of willy-nilly spread all over the place uh, so that's it but it i, I accept what your, your question is um and it needs to be looked at in in more detail uh but there are there are ways and means of doing it brilliant thank you and um, we've had a further question, uh, if we may, concerning how, what the planning process is for these kind of lagoons. What what steps are taken to br bring a uh, a project to development and completion? Sure. Um, water company would, or the uh, particular client would, would apply for a planning permission. Uh, we would obviously provide the designs of the system. And the planners will look at the, the merits and the, uh, uh, the pros and cons of the design. I, I, I'm assuming I'm not a planner myself. Uh, but as, as we found with Holcomb, uh, North Norfolk planners viewed this as being a, a very appropriate solution for a, a small community. And I think one of the things that, that I've understood over the years is that tanker movements are key. 
you know, they want to know how many more tankers are going to be driving around on the road as a result of the wastewater treatment system that's proposed to be built. Traditional mechanical systems require sludge to re be removed, handled, and be removed. Sludge handling is a smelly business, and sludge removal requires tankers that are driving up and down the road. Typically, they've only got maybe three to five percent sludge in the tank, the rest is water. Uh, and as a result, you've got a, a tanker which is burning diesel uh, to drag water around the country to a reception facility where it's perhaps dewatered further, and then it's caked, put into a cake product, and then it's dragged back out to wherever the disposal point is, land or whatever. Uh, so where we can demonstrate to the planners that there are no tanker movements required, where we can also position the system rather than being next to an A road, where we can position it somewhere further away that doesn't actually impact on anybody, uh, that provides us with a great benefit and a, an advantage uh, compared to uh, other systems. One of the nice things that uh, we see when we, or people see when they look at our sites, while I like to show you pictures of aerial photographs, of course, when people on the ground are looking at it, all they see is a grass bank. So there no, there's no hard engineering at all. There's no concrete structures. Uh, there's no, we, I mean, we put a fence round. Uh, again, that's required. Uh, the, the insurance companies require that. But as far as uh, as far as actual construction, it's a very soft but engineered solution, which fits in very nicely in rural conditions and rural environments, um, as 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 perhaps um, you know one would like to be able to show at some point. Thank you, John. Thank you. And are there l linking to um, planning and development um obviously the the your projects serve a, ultimately serve a housing scheme or a hospitality facility is there a minimum or indeed a maximum size of project that that your solutions would be appropriate for is there a point where the development is too small or, or indeed too big um we we wouldn't do an individual house uh, or a, a a number of small houses together. I think it just our cost of cost of construction and and really actually to be fair, Chris, it's only a it's only a cost issue. It's not a process issue. Um, you know we could build a, a small lagoon system for a for an individual house, uh, and the biological processing will operate. It will provide the treated effluent that's required. I think what we find is the cost of cap cost per capita at the smaller populations uh, does go up quite significantly, as it does with all systems, of course. Uh, but maybe you find that, uh, you know, septic tanks and, you know, a, a rebed, depending on what the climate's like, uh, you know, is a is a, uh, a more cost-effective alternative. Our, our, our base level, I guess, was probably about 100, 100 people. Um, at that level, while it is, while the cost, of, cost per capita is high, um, it's still comparative, comparable with other solutions. And um, while we do require more land than a little cluster or something like that, uh, it's the cost of operation and the ease of operation, uh, which the clients like at that, uh, that particular point. Where we started off, I guess our, our populations 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 have been uh, very, uh, have really been where we've been working. Um, but we're now at, in this country up to, as you see, with Warren Mill up to 3,000 for there. And then the site at Withensea, which is currently in construction, uh, is 15,000. Uh, so we're gradually moving up the scale. And I think with new technologies, this is always the way. Um, you start with a small one just in case it doesn't work. Uh, and then gradually you see how you can develop that onto larger and larger facilities. Recently, we did a design uh, for United Utilities for uh, about 80,000 people um, and you know, where they were replacing or wanting to replace an activated sludge plant. Uh, we were able to demonstrate a much more cost effective solution uh, than replacing it with another activated sludge plant. Uh, land was an issue, um, so that that didn't go ahead. But I think as far as where, 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 does, where is the limit? Again, in other parts of the world, uh, land is the only limitation. And as we get larger and larger, uh, there are some marvelous uh, large lagoon-based facilities around the world. Outside Nairobi, for instance, the Dandora facility uh, is dealing with the whole population of Nairobi. 
Uh, to the west of Melbourne, there is a large lagoon system, uh, which is treating about 500,000 cubic meters a day of wastewater. Uh, and and it's when you start to get into that sort of size, you find that the cost of operation is so much smaller, and so much e and the system is so much easier to operate uh, that the investment in land actually uh, has a real payback and uh, compared to putting in mechanical trigger works. And I I just I just one of the things. In a conference I attended in Nairobi a couple of years ago, the consulting engineering firms were very much saying that Africa is going to have to compromise on wastewater treatment expectations uh, because they can't afford mechanical treatment works. And you wonder again whether the consultants really are doing the right thing uh, for uh, for uh, for the for the country. Uh, in so many cases today, we find that this technology is not being uh, is not within the consultants anymore. It's not being taught within universities anymore. Um, the only thing that they're being taught and the only thing that's being offered by consultants is pretty much activated sludge, contact stabilization, MBRs, uh, SBRs, all the mechanical solutions, which are all based on activated sludge. And anything that is, uh, anything that is really sus sustainable, I mean, talking about 80% operating costs, not 5% savings in energy, on pumps it is just not being it's not available to consultants so this is why we as a company find that we're getting inquiries from all over the world um, where consultants are perhaps not able to provide the same information thank you thank you and are, are there any sites that are more or less suitable to construct the lagoons both both um, in terms of ground condition but also um, distance from the ultimate site being served by the facility? So one of the advantages, as I mentioned previously, is, is we have great flexibility in where we place our wastewater treatment system. We're not required to be serviced by an A-road. Uh, so where we find that uh, water, ground conditions, let's say high water table, is a problem, uh, you know, then we have an ability to move it. Uh, move the system to somewhere else where perhaps it is is more uh, more suitable. There are issues of um, septicity in pipelines uh, where you get long pipelines, uh, and certainly that is a problem for um, uh, mechanical plants um, where they don't like septic wastewater arriving at them because it's of odor issues. Uh, and there's injection systems you can put uh, uh, put systems that you can put uh, chemicals into the pipeline to keep it oxic. Um, as far as our system is concerned, all our wastewater, when it enters, is introduced at the bottom uh, of the lagoon. So it's introduced into a completely aerobic environment. And so any septicity is dealt with. So no, we're, we're not worried about length of pipeline uh, at all, because we don't have any open gap between where the wastewater comes in before it goes into the into the lagoon itself. Uh, so we don't have any odor issues. Uh, so no, we, we have great flexibility in where we can position our systems. Uh, high water table is a problem. Uh, we don't really want to be dewatering these uh, these areas, um, and so it's. But we've been able to uh, change the design slightly, uh, slightly shallower ponds, larger, slightly larger footprint in the in the fens in the area of the fens, obviously, which has high groundwater, uh, to be able to overcome many of the issues. Uh, but as I said earlier, each site is different, each issue is different, um, and we we have to look at each one on its own. Thank you. Um, a, f a further question, um, John, I'm, I'm going to com combine two questions here that have come in concerning a typical lifetime or lifespan for these projects and also in particular the, the, the uh, life, lifespan and carbon footprint of the liners and how often they're replaced and whether they're re they themselves are recyclable. Okay. Um, so uh, the uh, the lifespan of the uh, te the systems, everything that we manufacture is made out of stainless steel. Uh, so that has a uh, an extremely durable lifetime. Um, certainly, the longest system we have operating here in the UK is 21 years. Uh, we've not replaced any of the mechanical components within the system. I think one bearing actually we, we had to replace one bearing, and that's it. Um, the liner that was installed uh, is still flexible, 
Uh, there are no cracks in it, there's no tears in it. Uh, so we, we expect the polyethylene liner that we're using uh, to last certainly another 10 years uh, and maybe even longer than that. Uh, your, the question, uh, the liner life, the life of polyethylene liners uh, when used in landfill sites has to be 100 years. Uh, these are obviously covered. Um, so the sunlight is not allowed to penetrate to them. Um, whereas obviously ours are open. Now we can put a sacrificial layer over the, the top bit, uh, the bit around the freeboard uh, to uh, obviously protect that. But the liners today are so much, uh, so much stronger than they were you know, even 20 years ago, and certainly back in the 70s as well, um, that there's more carbon black within the liners. So we, we are able to uh, get a 30 year warranty on all the liners that we put in. Uh, so we have certainly got 30 years uh, and the expectation is that, that it would be longer than that. In some of the sites I visited in Israel, there's, there's one in particular, uh, which is just down at the, uh, in the Dead Sea area there. Uh, so it's 400 meters below sea level. When I visited there about 10 years ago, it had already been there for 40 years uh, and the liner was in great shape, uh, still very flexible, no cracking at all. Um, now, as far as recycling, um, I couldn't answer the question of whether they'll be recycled or not. Um, the likelihood, as I imagine, polyethylene can be recycled, uh, but we haven't had a situation where we've needed to do that as yet. No, thank you, John. And we're, we're coming close to the scheduled end of, of the seminar, um, but there are two, well, a, f a further question, if I may, um, possibly a slightly fastball uh, technical question as to part, uh, one part of it is whether the water from the lagoons can be brought to a, um, a standard that could discharge into a triple SI or similar protected site, and also whether the lagoons have to comply with the Floods and Reservoir Act. Um, uh, so the first part of your question is yes. Um, you know, we, we will design a system to whatever requirements are made. Um, the, the consent requirements do, change, do vary depending on triple SI requirements. Um, uh, we have, uh, you know, we, if, if it's required to remove nitrogen, we'll remove nitrogen. If it's required to move phosphorus, then we can bring in a system to remove phosphorus as well. Uh, you know, that is all capable to do, it's all possible to do. Um, and as far as your, your second, the second part of the question uh, is concerned, uh, which has just literally popped out of my head, just remind me again, Chris, sorry. Uh, uh, compliance with the Floods and ah, Reservoir Act. Yeah, no. uh, so the, the, the construction uh, does require, does, is required to meet the Reservoirs and Construction Act. Uh, but that, of course, has a, uh, has a capacity, a volume capacity uh, on it, um, just as uh, any of the large irrigation reservoirs that are being built around East Anglia at the moment, um, you know, they do have to meet that. Different reservoir uh, inspectors take different views, I'm finding, in construction. Uh, certainly the Withensea project we're working on at the moment uh, has 70... Uh, 72,000 cubic meters in each cell, uh, so that is required to. Uh, and but but the the construction is typically about 50% below ground level and 50% above. So that 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 is in that is in excess of the 25,000 cubic meters at the time uh, uh, that requires uh, obviously uh, uh, certification. Uh, but most of the ones that we built uh, previously, the smaller population ones have been below that requirement, so not required uh, to meet that, uh, not required to be certified. Thank you, John. And just just to conclude, if I, if I may, a, f a final question. Um, is it always necessary to have two cells for a system? It is required to have two cells. Um, one of the robust, uh, one of the robust benefits of the, of the process is that um, where you do get peak storms and peak loads that come into the primary cell, uh, that is able to average out and smooth out those peak loads. And then as much water comes into the front cell, treated effluent effectively tips out of the back cell. So that ensures that we have reliability of effluent 
reliability to meet our consent, irrespective of what is actually happening on the front end. If we only have one cell, first of all, you, you typically get about 80% removal per stage. So in order to be able to get to a discharge consent through one cell, you'd have to really extend the retention time and you're still then very vulnerable to any changes in load that's being applied. We've we found it much better to actually provide a primary cell and a secondary cell to typical discharge requirements. But in some cases, we need to look at a third cell as well if we're getting down to very, very tight consents um, that, are, that might be required to be met. But for reliability, robustness, uh, treatment, uh, treatment reliability, uh, two stages of treatment are by far and away the best way to go. John, thank you very much indeed, and thank you to everyone who's joined our seminar today. Um, we'll now bring the, call, the seminar to a close, and thank you once again for joining us.